Hello and welcome to today's discussion of the River Continuum concept. The River Continuum concept was written by Van Oat et al. in 1980. The River Continuum concept attempts to describe how a stream or river or flowing body of water changes from headwaters until it becomes a large river system. So I thought first we should probably define what these terms mean. A river is any flowing body of water. Oftentimes we refer to them as a lodic system. And in fact, lodic system is much more, uh, provides a lot more depth than the term river because river equals stream equals creek equals branch fork. There's many different terms we can use to describe flowing bodies of water. But oftentimes we start trying to think, well, a creek is probably smaller than a river and a branch is smaller than a creek, so on and so forth. The best term is lodic system or stream. Both of these mean flowing bodies of water, and they don't really give a lot of definition of size. We're going to get into that in just to a moment here. What is a continuum then? Well, the continuum is the concept which attempts to describe how elements of a continuous sequence or series differ from one another. So that's a big long definition saying, well, how would the headwaters differ from the midreaches from the large river portions of this loading system? Another way of thinking of it is a spectral and you're comparing the ends and middles of different portions along that spectrum. So let's kind of get into this idea and this concept of what a uh, flowing body of water and what these systems are and how a large stream compares to a small stream. A way to do this is something called stream ordering. And what I've got here is I've got a stream network and this stream network flows in this direction. And you can tell that because it has small stream portions, these headwaters, that are branched and flowing into the large main stem. What we're going to do is we're going to go through and label each one of these with the corresponding stream order. If you remember a couple lectures ago, we went over this in class. So I'm just going to briefly go through and do this without providing a tremendous amount of explanation. However, we will go into this later on. So first off, we're going to label all the first order streams. So these are all first order streams. Now what we can do is we can go through and label the second order streams. If you remember, it takes two of the same magnitude streams in order to change stream order. So since we have a first order stream joining another first order stream, at this point, we would consider that to be a second order stream. Same goes for right here. Same goes for right here, right here, and right here. Since a second order stream meets a first order stream, it remains a second order stream at that point. Remember, you have to have equaling magnitude in order for the streams to change. So I'm gonna go ahead and go label where all of that happens. And I think those are the only two. What we now has is we now have a second order stream meeting another second order stream. So at this point, we now have a third order stream. And we also have a third order stream here. Since a third order stream meets a second order stream at this point, it remains a third order stream at that point. However, at this point, we have a third order stream meeting another third order stream. That means we have a fourth order stream at this point. So you can see as the numbers of the stream order get larger, so do we expect the stream to get larger. That's an important concept because it starts giving us an idea of the magnitude of streams. And that is what we're going to find in this image. The image I'm sharing with you here is from Van Oat et al. 1980. And you can see that round down here. This is one of the original diagrams published in, this, in his publication. If we look at this like a graph on the y-axis, we can see in stream size or order, just like we came from. So we have first, second, third, all the way to 12. And then along the x-axis, we'll see relative channel width. So if we take a look at first order streams, we expect them to be very narrow. And a 12th order stream, we expect to be very wide. Since a first, second, third, and sometimes even fourth, but generally first, second, third order streams, we just focused on those. The stream channel width is small enough that the canopy can cover 90% or more of the channel. 
But once you get beyond the third or fourth ordered streams, the channel width becomes so wide that the canopy can it could cover everything. And that plays a major role because remember, sunlight provides 99.9% .9 of the energy to all ecosystems on the planet. This happens to be an ecosystem in which sun provides 100% of the energy. The energy comes from this material falling into the stream called alloctonous material. Alloctonous material are things like sticks and leaves and any sort of organic matter falling into the stream. If you notice, there's another term here called coarse particulate matter. You will also see that labeled and talked about as coarse particulate organic matter or CPOM. CPOM shifts from the in the headwater CPOM or coarse particulate matter and then when we get into the mid reaches and further down we get into something called FPOM which is fine particulate organic matter and we can see that down into these reaches. Why does it break down? Why does it shift from coarse to fine? The reason it makes this shift is due to the aquatic macroinvertebrate communities. Remember aquatic macroinvertebrates are anything that live in the water that's larger that you can see with the naked eye and they're an invertebrate. A lot of these are insects but not all of them are. We're going to focus on the insects for just a moment though. In the upper reaches we find a large proportion of the insect community known as shredders. If we take a look at this diagram, this diagram makes up a pie chart. Imagine all of this meaning 100% of the insect or, back or aquatic macroinvertebrate community in this area. The shredders make up a large proportion of it. And what does a shredder do? A shredder will tear these coarse particulate organic matter pieces apart. Things like leaves, sticks, stuff like that are falling in. They'll shred them apart. They're not actually eating the leaves or sticks, they're eating the fungi and um, bacterial communities that have inhabited these areas and starting to eat it themselves. So they'll tear them apart and they're eating all these little uh, bacteria and fungal communities and stuff. Next, we have the collectors. And collectors are just an organism that filters things out of the water. So as these shredders are tearing it up, the collectors then are getting the pieces that the shredders are breaking down. So we see collectors starting to play a major role as we move down. Let's now take a look at the mid reaches and we can see that shredders have been replaced by grazers. And in fact, the mid reaches and upper reaches, you can sort of flip flop. The small proportion of grazers turns into shredders and this large portion of shredders turned into grazers as we move from the upper reaches or the headwaters to the mid reaches respectively. So grazers are any insect that will graze and what are you grazing upon in a stream generally algae growing on a subst or substrate you have to have sunlight for that algae to grow so when the canopy opens up enough in these areas it allows the sunlight to penetrate the rocks and everything like that penetrate the water and hit the rocks so that algae can grow on the rocks but the water is still shallow enough in these areas that it's the sunlight can reach the bottom. When we start getting into the deeper reaches of the stream, that's where we start running into some problems with light striking the bottom. And there's a couple other things we'll get into in just a moment. But right through here is where we see the grazers playing a major role because again, the sunlight can penetrate and hit those rocks and create that nice little substrate for those algae communities to grow on. So the grazers like snails and some caddisflies and various things will then eat off of that substrate. When we get into the large river system, you've noticed we've lost the shredders and grazers and we now only have collectors and predators. The reason we have a large proportion of collectors is the stream has slowed down significantly in these large river portions. When a stream slows down, all of the substrate or excuse me, all the substances being carried by the river falls out and covers the substrate. So we would expect not to have very many shallow portions through here. And if we did, those shallow portions are probably going to be a mud or fine silted bottom versus a nice clean rocky bottom up through here. So you're not going to get the algae communities that the grazers need, and you're not going to be narrow enough to have a lot of sea palm coming in the river that your shredders need. So we're going to be dominated by collectors throughout this entire region. Now, what you will note is that predators tend to stay the same. And why do predators stay the same? Predators make up the same proportion in the upper, mid, and lower reaches. 
The reason is, is due to this concept here that we discussed a while back. This, you may note, is a trophic pyramid. And if you look, the trophic pyramid at the very top, we see top predators, and then the next below is intermediate predators. Predators make up a very small proportion of the amount of energy available in an ecosystem. When we take a look back at this image, we can see that there's some predators here, here, and here, but it's the same proportion. The reason is, is these insects and microinvertebrates, they don't care if they're eating collectors or grazers or shredders. It doesn't matter to them. They're just still eating whatever's available. But you can only have so many predators because that's as much energy as available. Remember, only 10% of the energy transfers from one level to the next. And you can see that denoted very clearly here with the energy, 1,000 to 100 to 10 to 1. So we would expect to find fewer predators than shredders, collectors, or grazers. But the concept of the proportion of predators shouldn't change as we move through this area. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about the fishes over here. Remember, the, the term fishes is correct when you have multiple types of fish. So we have trout, smallmouth bass, perch, and catfish. Trout usually inhabit the upper reaches of the stream. They need very cold and highly oxygenated water. The upper reaches of a stream is generally have a higher gradient, which means they're steeper, which allows water to fall. And when it makes these waterfalls and ripples and such, it's aerating it and putting atmospheric oxygen into the water. Smallmouth bass are sort of what we'll call a tweener. They're in between the top and the middle. They usually require cool oxygenated water, but not necessarily cold. And then finally, perch can survive in these sort of the upper portions of the mid reaches. They don't mind, or excuse me, the lower portions of mid reaches, the upper portion of the large river reaches. They don't have to have as much oxygenated water. And in fact, cold water can put a, a, an actual impact on them. The same goes for catfishes. Catfishes like to live in the larger river portions because they live on the bottom and they're going to be searching around for a lot of dead decaying matter and various other organisms that's going to fall out. So temperature is really what's driving the differences in these fish communities here. So that's a kind of a quick little explanation of how the river continuum concept impacts how organisms are distributed in a stream. What I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about your assignment. Remember, this will be posted up to Moodle for you to do. So I'm going to go ahead and show it to you here first, though. And, and you can see the instructions that respond to the following questions. Each one of these is worth five points. So I want you to kind of give the same amount of feedback per question. So it's a 35 point assignment. First off, what role the canopy play in a river continuum concept? Remember there, we're talking about channel width and canopy. So how does canopy cover relate to channel width? That's sort of what we were just talking about. How can you compare and contrast coarse particulate organic matter and fine particulate organic matter? Next, why does the proportion of predators not change? Just discuss that. Why do lower reachers have no shredders and grazers? Why do you see upper and middle reachers with a large proportion of collectors? And then finally, how does temperature drive uh, the distribution of fishes within a stream? All of this can be explained by this image and this talk. I'd like to have this due within a week. And if you could, just upload your assignment to Moodle, and we'll go from there. Thanks, guys.